All right. So lab six is um, we're back to the original labs, which for you guys, that means that uh, the, the instructions have been iterated on multiple years. This is actually the same lab that I did when I took the class and when I, and I actually, so, so it's been around a while. So um, that's good because the instructions, um, you guys are no longer the guinea pigs for new, new instructions as far as the lab goes. Um, and so you might notice that they are going to look a tad different. In fact, they're gonna look like this. Um, when you click on the instructions, it's no longer just a PDF. You actually have access to um, this whole bit. And these instructions, uh, they can, you'll have this document and then there's also a website um, and it should all be there. So, you know, you can use the one, but if I talk about or show something on the website, know that I'm going to uh, Mike, Michael info forward slash DB one um, because there are some excellent resources on here and they actually made these from the website. So they should be pretty much identical, but the website has a few, extra little bells and whistles, I guess you could say, because it's a, a, a custom website, so they can do a little bit more. But for the most part, the instructions are gonna be here, so I'm gonna be referring to this quite a bit. So um, you'll go through all these instructions, and, and it should be pretty good. Um, the only difference is, is uh, you'll want to expand the instructions because it will have instruction details and that sort of thing. So, so yeah, let's, uh, let's kind of just dive right in because what I kind of want to do um, is I want to go over the lab just a little bit um, real quick, kind of talk about things. Um, and along the way, we'll, we'll reiterate over some of those newer uh, statements like the alter table. Um, we'll talk a little bit about creating tables again because we didn't see too much of that, but a little bit. Um, and we'll really talk about the logic behind all this so that way it makes sense. Um, because I, I put this in the announcement, but what I really like about the labs here and going forward is that they are very much built around a, a business scenario, right? Or, or as if you were actually going to be building this database or altering this database. So one thing that I really like about it is that we're, um, it's instead of just, you know, writing queries for the sake of, you know, fulfilling the lab, now we actually have an end goal. Um, and so I kind of want to talk about that because I think it really helps you, uh, you know, to solve a problem. First, you need to know what the problem is per se. So, so we're going to talk a lot about that. And I'm hoping to get through that pretty quickly um, because what I'd really like to do is then spend a little bit of time. We'll build just here in the in our own little demo. We will build another another little quick table. Um, so you can kind of see what it would look like from scratch if we were going to start from scratch. And it also gives you a chance to see uh, just some design elements, you know, because we're going to, I actually have never built the database before. I actually thought about it when I was driving home from work um, about what we could do. And I think it'll be fun. Um, and then you guys can uh, try it on your own if you want or, or not. It's up to you. But anyways, let's, let's dive right in. So the first thing that I want to talk about, which someone asked, um, is about um, can you rerun the script um, and so you don't have to run pieces of code individually? And absolutely yes. And so uh, real quick, what I'm gonna recommend you do because this one right now calls apply Oracle lab 5.sql. And you know, lab five added the ratings table and that sort of stuff. Um, and, and that's all well and good, um, but it actually doesn't apply to what we're going to be doing in the future. Um, and so what we're going to do is I'm actually going to recommend that we just take out the call to apply Oracle Lab 5, and we are going to make this kind of be the start of our chain reaction, so to speak. So what we're going to do here is instead of calling Lab 5, um, we are going to have it call um, our cleanup scripts and then our create script. Um, so if we go inside of our Oracle directory inside lib here, um, there's a couple different things. And the first one that's important is our is in the utility directory and it's called cleanup oracle.sql. So what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna change this and we're gonna say cleanup, or utility, sorry. We wanna make sure we get the right file path, utility, and then cleanup oracle.sql. And what that's gonna do is it's going to clean up the entire database. It's gonna delete everything 
and then reinstall it. So, yeah, so it's going to completely erase everything we've done. So the our, the, uh, the the rental rating, the I, the rating agency tables and the rating tables are going to be wiped out, but we can always rebuild them, right? In fact, we could actually, uh, we could put all this in lab five if we wanted, um, but I'm going to put them here for now. So we call our cleanup and that erases everything. Um, and the reason we want to erase everything is because maybe there's a problem with it. Um, but basically what it does is it guarantees that every time we run apply Oracle lab six, it's going to completely erase everything so we can build it from scratch. So that way nothing ever gets gummed up, hopefully. And then the next one, like we said, we want to recreate it. So we're going to use the create Oracle store to dot SQL script. And that one's under create instead of utility. So create Oracle store to dot SQL. And that will create our database structures and basically just create the tables. Um, and then we got to call the precede. So I'm just going to take copy this again and change the last two directories. So precede Oracle store dot SQL. And then, oh, and I forgot precede in there because it's in the precede directory. There we go. Oh yeah, and someone someone said we got to call lib1, which is absolutely right. So on all these, we, we need lib1. That's why I make sure you guys are here to keep me in line. There we go. Now let's take and copy this again. And we'll call these and make sure they work too. So then we call the seed. And, and I, I've gotten this question a lot that the seed, let's see, create, I think I copied two, didn't I? We clean up, create, pre-seed. Yep, so we just need one of these. What we mean by seed or pre-seed is we are seeding data. We're just putting the data in the table. And it is seeding.sql. That one's kind of the odd one out. Um, but I'm actually going to test these real quick. So I'm going to open up a console and we are going to, and the nice thing is, is because we're using absolute path here, it doesn't matter where we are in the system when we launch SQL plus, um, I can call these and I'm just going to call them one at a time here. Then it gets created. And I'm using con uh, control C to copy and control shift V to paste in the terminal. Pasting in the terminal takes a little bit more because control C is already kind of a well-known key combo that does other stuff. So then we have our pre-seed and then our seeding. And they all worked. Normally, if, if they didn't work, we'd get an error. Um, but real quick, just to kind of show you again, because we'll just paste all that in there. If I were to call this cleanup script, and then try to select everything from contact, the table doesn't exist. But if I run the create, and then I say select everything from contact, I get a table, but no rows are in the table. Um, the precede, I shouldn't use contact because it, it really goes, if I select everything from system user, because that's where it kind of precedes some of that data, that and common lookup. Now we get some data, but if I select everything from contact, still no rows. But then if I run seeding, then I get data. So you can kind of see how every time we run this, it's going to completely obliterate everything and then rebuild it. And, and from here on out, all of our labs are going to be chained together. So even when we're clear at lab 12, your lab 12 is going to run lab six. And so um, it'll be this, you know, it'll be like the lady who swallowed the fly, but apply Oracle lab 12, 
ran apply oracle lab 11 and down the line until it gets to lab six and then it clean it cleans everything up and then rebuilds it so every time you run a lab from here on out it it will it'll delete everything and rebuild it so now i'm going to actually get to where we need to be and we can start talking about the lab instructions just a little bit so um does anyone have any questions about that does it is that uh does that make sense because i know we haven't been like chaining too much yet so i wanted to make sure um that that makes sense to everybody because this is the only time so we put this in lab six and this is the only time we'll actually need it in lab seven we'll just have one that calls lab six and because then it will run this regardless all right i don't want to beat a dead horse so we will continue on let me hurry and log in here and then we will start going over some of these instructions here real quick All right, so in the instructions, uh, step one is we want to add a column to the rental item table. We're actually gonna add two columns. Um, and so we are going to use that alter table uh, statement. And so real quick, just to go over that again, um, I'm gonna show you how we would add a column to rental item. Um, so let's see, I'm gonna work right in here. So step one is we write the alter statement. So we would say alter table rental item because that's the table we want to alter. And, and the big thing, um, if you ever get confused between alter and update, um, and I think I've said this before, but tables, you'll hear me say the word structure a lot, right? Um, because I like to think about uh, database tables kind of like a house where um, the table itself, the, the structure is, is the building. Um, and the data inside of it is, you know, all the stuff that we bring when we move in. So, you know, when we move out of a house or when we first move into an apartment or whatever, you know, it's empty. All that's there is the structure. Um, and that's what we, you know, the table itself is the structure. And so when we use alter, we are dealing with the structure, not the stuff inside of it. Um, even though it could have effects on the stuff inside of it, say, you know, we decide to tear a room off the side of our house. Yeah, we're going to lose the stuff inside unless we move it somewhere else first. But when we use the alter statement, we are dealing with the structure of the table, not the data. When we use an update statement, we are changing the stuff inside of the table. We are actually affecting the data. So that's kind of how I like to keep those, those separate. And you'll actually hear in the book, we talk about data definition language and data manipulation language. And the definition language or DDL is the structures. That's why they call it, you're defining the data definition. You know, what is a rental item? Well, it's the table defines it. Um, and then similarly, the data manipulation language is our uh, we're manipulating the data inside so that's kind of how i like to keep those in mind so if you come across those a ddl and dml are are two things and alter is a ddl statement because we're dealing with the structure so we're going to alter the structure of the table and what are we doing we are adding a column and so we want to add rental item type and then we give it a data type. And to know the data type, we are going to refer back to our instructions here. Um, so let's look at the details. Um, rental item type is an integer, which means we use the number data type. Now, you'll notice that in here, it actually gives you the foreign key. And it tells you what the reference and all that kind of stuff. Um, but if you try to actually create the foreign key now, there's gonna be an issue because Right now we already have rows in rental item. And if we, when we add this column, those are all gonna be null. And it's not gonna let us build a foreign key constraint if there's null values. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna add the columns, plain Jane. So just uh, the column name and the data type. Just like that, we're gonna add rental item type and it's a number. 
Now you could write this statement twice because that's going to add one column. There's going to be, an, and you could write it twice. If you want to, you can write them both together. Um, and you actually surprisingly don't even need a comma. Um, one of the rare instances where you don't. Um, and then here you would type the other name of your column and go like that. So um, obviously it's not going to be called some other column, but you guys get the picture. So this would actually add two columns. It would add a rental item and a column called some other column. And in fact, let's save this. We're going to run it, make sure it works. So we're going to run apply. Oh, and real quick, um, a little tip is if you want to see, like let's say you can't remember the name of your file. Normally in Linux, we type LS, but because we're in this SQL prompt, uh, it doesn't recognize that command, but we can use the ls command if we put an exclamation mark in front of it and type ls. And then we can see the files that are in our current directory. So I like to use that because I always forget what I name files. So apply oracle lab 6.sql. And it's going to take a minute because it's going to destroy everything and then rebuild it. Up, oh, and we get an issue here. Um, Oh, it's just the, it's this verify table structure. So, so no problem there um, because we're not there yet. Cause see, it's trying to run the validation queries for our step six. So if we scroll up to where we're actually at on step one, clear up here. Step one. All right, so here's our alter table statement and table altered, so that means that we're good. So now let's take a look at rental item. And see, now you'll see that we have rental item type and our some other column sitting there. Now obviously you want, won't want to use some other column, you'll want to use the real one, which is rental item price. But I wanted to, to run that so you could see because normally we would have to drop the table or drop the column and re-add the correct one. But since we're destroying everything and rebuilding it, we can just change this and rerun our file here. And then let's describe rental item. And now you'll see we get the correct columns because it drops it for us with the cleanup script. So that's our alter table stuff. We added a column in this case. We'll be doing some more um, later on the lab. So um, let's move on. So the create table, we're going to create a price table um, and it's going to hold prices for our movies. Um, and it kind of gives it all to you here. So if you have any questions, um, like I said, we're going to be covering this create table thing here in just a minute because uh, there's a lot of concepts that are inside of a create table step. So I'm not going to hit on this too much besides one thing. Inside here, there's a check constraint, which is brand new. And basically what a check constraint does is it makes it so it either has to be a certain value. In this case, um, we're saying that active flag has to either be a yes or a capital Y or a capital N for yes and no. Um, so, so I'll show you how to build that here in just a second. Um, so we're gonna kind of hop over step two for now um, because we did create some tables last time and we're gonna cover it again here in just a minute. So we're gonna create that, that price table um, in step two. And then step three, um, we do a couple of different things. So we're going to rename a column from item release date to release date. And this one, um, this one's probably one of the more not confusing. You're, you're not going to come across it quite as, as much. So um, I real quick just kind of wanted to show you how we would rename a column. So step three here. Great table. There's step three. All right. So we're going to rename the column. So this one uh, like I said, a quick Google would uh, find it, but just to show you, um, to rename a column, we do an alter table because we're changing the table. Um, but this one has this nice little 
It's not near as complicated as what you think. You just rename item release date to release date. And it's simple as that. Um, so not too bad. In fact, we can take and let's just run this real quick just to try it out. Make sure. And table altered. And now we can describe item. And you'll notice now that instead of item release date, it's just release date. So, so nice and easy on that one. Just almost say what you want in that case. So not too bad. All right, let's check. The bullet point number two is we're going to insert some items into the, some new records into the item table. Um, and this one I kind of want to go over because we are going to do something specific. And it kind of talks about it here. It says insert three new DVD releases into the item table. Um, and it says you should insert a value in the release date column that should always be less than 31 days during the course. Um, and it will pretty much tell you how to do it right here. So you use this for the release date column values of everything into the item table. Okay, so that one's not too bad. Um, and then you'll notice that this item rating, because we are erasing, you'll just insert like PG or whatever. And it kind of shows you um, some of the movies you should enter. So you can enter Tron, Ender's Game, Elysium. If you don't care, um, because in this case, it actually doesn't matter what the title of these movies are. All that matters is their release date. So if you want to, I've always kind of something I've done. If you want to pick your three favorite movies um, and insert those, it's always fun when I'm grading to see what people's favorite movies are. It says a lot about you, what you enjoy. So um, if you want to, you can use the one they have um, for the titles or you can pick your favorite movies. It's, it's kind of fun. So if you want to pick your favorite movies, go for it. Um, it's not going to be that big of a problem at all in the future. So in fact, it's, it's not a problem at all. Um, you just know that your titles will be different, but that's fine. But like I said, the release date has to be there because it will, this will cause a problem in the future um, because these are going to be our new movies. And so when we actually go to see like pricing and stuff like that, you, we need to make sure they have these. So on your release date, make sure you put the trunk sys date minus one. And what that does is it sets, basically it's like saying, hey, this movie released on DVD yesterday because it's always today sys date minus one. And what this trunk function does is it just, uh, it makes it so it can do math essentially because you know, today minus one usually causes issues, but if we truncate it, then it's not a problem. Basically, it takes off the timestamp. So it knows that we're talking about days. Um, so anyways, uh, does anyone have any questions about this right here? Okay, perfect. Um, so step C, and again, I apologize because we're going to talk about a lot of this, but I kind of want to give you an example without actually giving away the solutions to the lab. So um, we're going to talk about chained inserts um, quite a bit. Um, and it, it kind of describes it here. And I think once you see it, even if it's not exactly um, what we're talking about, it, it should make sense. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll come back to this here in just a minute. Um, and they give you all the data you're supposed to insert. Um, you're just inserting the Potter family. So Harry Potter, Ginny Potter, and Lily Luna Potter. You're going to insert all their information um, into, into your thing, into the table. But you do it um, in a chained way. So what you do is you write your insert into member, and that's going to be for all the Potters. So you do one, in, one member insert. And then you're going to do contact for Harry, address for Harry, street address for Harry, telephone for Harry. And then you re repeat uh, to all this stuff for Ginny and for Lily. And it kind of it kind of says it. And I, like I said, I think it'll make sense once we show ours is going to be a little bit smaller of an example. But I think it'll make sense. All right. Um, and then you're going to do rentals for them because we want to show that they're renting movies 
and uh, it, it tells you pretty much you're going to use today value for all the checkout date columns and a null value for the return date. Um, and it tells you that you can see the syntax for inserting into these tables in the rental inserts. So one nice thing is because we already have data in these tables and we know that a script runs them, we can actually, and it, I'm going to say cheat, but it's not actually cheating. We can look and see a perfect example of how to do this. So if I go into my Oracle folder and then in lib1 and then I look in this seed folder, there's uh, some really nice stuff. So like uh, for the rental inserts, we can actually click here and see rental. So if it were me doing this, I could take and copy this rental here and use this um, and just change the names and the move in the dates. And in this case, all we'd have to do is take off the, the return date. So there's a nice perfect little example here for you if you need it. Now the same thing with item. If we open up the item inserts, um, you'll notice that there are some inserts into item that you can use as an example that should help. Now for the, the members and stuff like that, it gets a, a little bit weird because they actually use some PL SQL. Um, oops, let's pull this up here. Um, but there is a good example. Actually, this isn't a PL SQL anymore. So this is actually a great example. Um, so you can actually take and use this as well. So you'll see that they do an insert into member and you'll want to make sure you use the group account .sql script because the potters are a family and so they're going to be a group account. You'll see that it inserts into member, right? And we don't know who this is yet. Um, and then we insert into contact and we insert Randy Win. So this is the Win family. And we insert Randy Win's contact record and then her address, her street address, and her telephone. And then we do Brian and we do all of his address, street address, telephone. And so, and the reason we do this is because all those things kind of lump together. So everyone is tied to the same member account. Um, and you'll notice that we use the sequence. In fact, um, before we go too much, I want to pause for just a second. We're just going to talk about a sequence. So I'm going to real quick create a sequence. And I think we've talked a little bit about this, but I want to make sure that we understand these completely. I'm going to create a sequence called a demo underscore S1. All right. And it's just going to be simple. Just a, a nice little sequence. Now, if I say select uh, next val, or we want to say select demo underscore s1 dot next val from dual we get one and if i keep doing this it's just going to keep counting up right so whenever we do an insert we're going to pull the next available number now we could have said that this started at a thousand and one like our database does and then it would have counted up from a thousand but here we are, we're at 45. I don't want it to be an even number. So we're at 46. Now, in this case, so let's say member is, the member ID is 46, right? So we're going to pretend this is 46. So if we wanted to tie Harry Potter to that member, instead of writing a uh, subquery like we did here, we still have access to that number. So what we can do is we can then say, select demo underscore s1 dot curval and I say from dual just so we can see it and you'll notice that I get 46 and I can rerun this and it will always be 46 until I run next val again and then it will continue to be 47 for the curval so if you want the next available value you run next val if you want the current value, you run curval. And so because we're chaining this information together, so if you picture like a chain with links, like an actual physical chain, a member would be the top link in the chain. And it would have three strands coming off of it. The first strand would be Harry Potter. So um, contact 
would be linked to that first chain. Um, and we do that by using this member.s1.curval because it's going to pull the current value of, of a member. And because we just did an insert into member, that's the one it's gonna link to. So we, we link that to member. And then for the contact ID, we pull the next available value. So now we have, we're, we're tied to member and we pulled a new value for the contact ID. And then we come down here to address and we wanna link this address to our contact. And so we use contact.curval. We use the contact sequence.curval. Um, and then that will link it to the contact. And so you can see that we just put another link on our Harry Potter chain. And then street address, do the same thing. We're gonna put another link on our chain. And then telephone. And telephone's kinda of weird because technically this chain would make a loop because uh, telephone not only is linked to address but also to contact. So telephone would actually go up and link back to contact. But, you know, it's still its own little strand. So basically we're putting a little loop on uh, for Harry Potter. And then when we get down to Ginny, and I know that this is for somebody else, but we're pretending it's the Potters, we would start another contact link. And because we're still tying to that same member, we don't do another member insert because the minute we do another member insert, for example, if we said, let's do all the member inserts, then all the contact inserts, then all the address inserts, then all the street address and telephone, if we did it that way, we would have to write subqueries for all of our foreign key values like this. Where if we do it in this order, because it's the last one there, we can use the sequence. Does that make sense to everybody? Is there anyone completely lost on how that goes? And like I said, we're gonna, we're gonna kinda do a little example here in a minute that I hope will help drive the nail home. It's awfully quiet. That doesn't instill confidence. Every, is, is anyone not good? Or is, is there someone? Oh, okay. go ahead. Okay, perfect. Sorry, I, I, I know that that gets really old to listen to because it's just a lot of the same words regurgitated, but it, it, it is really important because it will, it'll help make that make a lot of sense. Okay, perfect. So let's, let's move on. So we do our, rent, our inserts there. Uh, okay. Because we'll do our inserts for the potters to actually get their stuff in. Then you're going to do the same thing for rental and rental item. Okay. And then step four is kind of uh, the big doozy. And step four, what we're going to do is we are going to change our common lookup table quite a bit. In fact, uh, um, we're going to change it a lot. Um, because, and, and I love this lab, I'm glad that we start here now because it gets really old. If we take a look, let's take a look at uh, common lookup. If we take a look at common lookup, you'll notice that we have common lookup ID and we have common lookup context, common lookup type, and common lookup meaning. And if we actually take a look at what is all inside of common lookup, and let's, uh, let's change our line size so it looks a little bit better. There we go. You'll notice that the common lookup context is actually the name of a table. So we have like our contact table, we have our member table, um, item table. Um, and you'll notice that the common lookup type is uh, a value that's all caps and then the descriptions like a fancy normal people way of, of typing. Well, what we want to do is we want to clean this up a bit and we want to make it so common lookup context is actually just common lookup table. So that way we know what table it goes to. And then we also want to add a column called common lookup column. So we know what it's referring to. So for example, on member, um, we want to know not only, we don't want to infer anything. So we want to add a, com, a column that says that this goes to credit card type because that's what it goes to. Um, so basically that way we know where all these little drop down menu type items refer to. Um, 
but there's one little hiccup and that's because down here for home and work, we have this multiple issue going on. Um, and so this is kind of going to be the big hang up here uh, because we've got to fix that. So it kind of tries to walk you through this. Um, and the first one being is that we drop a couple of indexes and we have to drop those indexes because if we don't, it's going to not let us do what we want to do. And we like to do what we like to do. So anyways, we're going to drop those, those indexes. Um, and then we're going to add our new columns. And the reason we have to drop those indexes is because, uh, um, or those two indexes is because we can't add our stuff because then they wouldn't be unique. So to drop those indexes, because I know indexes, I thought, yeah, I'm saying that right. To drop those indexes, we use a nice little thing. Let's see, where is it? Step four A, drop our indexes. We just say drop index and then the name of the index. So in this case, I'm gonna say common lookup and one. All right, so common lookup and one and U2. So you're gonna drop both those. I'm only gonna do one for now, just actually I'm gonna have to do both. So uh, let's just drop them both since we're gonna to have to, so we can kind of half demo this solution here. Two. All right, and that's going to drop those those two indexes. Let's uh, real quick just drop those. There we go. All right, and then you're going to add your three new columns. Um, and we we the nice thing is we we just saw how to add some columns right up here, but this time we're going to do three. So I'm just going to take this. We're going to come back down here. We're gonna add three columns, but we're gonna do a few different ones. So instead of rental item, obviously we're gonna say common lookup table. And it will say what the, the data type is in the instructions right after it. And so this one is going to be a character string that's 30 length. So we're gonna say var char 30. And then this one's going to be common lookup column. And there is a really valuable lesson that I think is often overlooked in this lab. Um, and that, and I've only had a couple of students even ask, they say, why do we add um, all three new columns? Because really we already have, uh, two of them. We have the context, which is the table, and we have the, and these should be var char twos. Um, we have the common lookup context, which is the table, and we have the common lookup uh, type, which is, and actually the code isn't the type, but we have one of them. We have common lookup context. Um, so they said, you know, why are we adding, why are we adding this record again? Um, and the reason, or this row, this column, sorry, I'm losing it. Why are we adding this column when we could just rename it? And the reason being is because we're going to make quite a bit of changes here. And because we're in a production, I guess, type environment, thank you for catching that. Um, it's good practice because we don't want to lose any data. So essentially what we're doing is we are copying, we're copying the data over to these new columns so we can then uh, make changes, make sure everything's good before we drop the old ones. So let's go ahead and run this. We get tabled altered. So now if we look at common lookup, you'll notice that now we have our three new columns down here below. So now what we wanna do is we want to um, update or move our data. Now this, this one is a little bit uh, more tricky um, because you're gonna use an update statement and it, it'll kind of walk you through it. So you're gonna use an update statement to copy 
the common lookup context column values that match table names to the common lookup table column. Now, the ones that match table names um, are going to be everything that does not contain that multiple. Um, so let's use that update statement. It's trying to say update common lookup. And we are going to set the common lookup table equal to, and what are we setting it equal to? Well, we are setting it equal to common lookup context values that match table names. And so in this case, we're common lookup context does not equal multiple. Right, and that is going to move all of the common lookup context values over to common lookup table. So in fact, I can run this and we get rows updated and I'm gonna select common lookup context so we can see it and common lookup table from common lookup. And here we can see that we copied everything over except for multiple. And then we're going to use an update statement to copy an address string literal value to the common lookup column where common lookup context contains multiple. So now we're going to figure out these two, two guys that we didn't get rolled over, right? And so we want to take care of them. So we're going to say update common lookup and we're going to set common lookup table equal to address where common lookup context does not equal multiple or does equal multiple sorry that would that would change all of the old ones all right now there's, there's a couple different ways you could do this, right? Because this is going to get all the ones that equal multiple and it's going to, uh, to throw them over there. We could also say at this point where a uh, common lookup table is null and it's gonna have the same effect because we only have those two null values. So that's what's kind of fun is I don't really care how you do it as long as at the end of the day, they're done. So we get our two rows updated. So let's rerun our query here. And now you'll notice that we have all of our new values set up here. Now, um, now the trickier part is we have to fix our common lookup column. Now, the nice thing is, is our database has really been designed well. So let's take a look at like member. Um, you'll notice that we have member type, credit card type, um, let's take a look at system user. Um, we have system user type, and then let's take a look at like telephone or address. Let's take a look at address. Telephone the same way. We have address type. So the nice thing is, is we can cheat here just a little bit. Um, and so we're gonna say update common lookup again. And we are going to set the common lookup column equal to now we've already moved this is one little spot where you can skip a step if you want to so we're right here on bullet number three and we're going to use an update statement to copy common lookup context column values that match table names concatenated with a type string um, but we can actually combine these two together because if you notice this handles the multiple and the other thing. Well, we've already kind of handled that problem, right? We did it with the common lookup table. So instead of setting it from common lookup context, we already have this common lookup table value here. And so we just want to add underscore type to it. 
And we want to do that for all the rows. So we won't even have a where clause. So this will change all of the common lookup column values to the table name underscore type. So if we reran our little query here, basically we're going to put underscore type on this. So let's give that a shot here. Let's just run this manually. We get our 20 rows updated. And let's add the common lookup column. And so here you'll see that we have all of our stuff. And instead of taking two statements like the instructions want us to do, we did it with one because we already have address here. There's no need to solve the same problem twice. So, and then, and there we go. And so that gets us down here because now what we need to do is we need to add rows for telephone because if we look, um, in fact, let's, let's just write a quick query here. If we say select um, telephone ID, let's say t.telephone ID, and the CL common lookup dot common lookup table, telephone T, enter join, if we pull this, we are going to find that our telephone types are now tied to the address common lookup records. And that's because we used to have them combined under multiple. Well, we don't want that. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to create new records in common lookup and then update the telephone table to be corresponding with the new, rec the new records. So, um, you know, we would say, did I uh, goof up the, Oh, it looks like they break this all up, but um, anyways, we put it all together. Um, so if I was going to uh, update, and that's not the right one. If we wanted to change a column, so basically because we want to change it all, we would write a nice little update, and this kind of talks over because I don't want to give it all away. Um, so we're going to insert and add two rows, two rows for the telephone tables lookup values. And right here, up, use an update statement to change the telephone type column values um, so that they hold the copy of the new ones. So we are going to, that's the last step actually, so let's go down here. There it is. So we're going to say update telephone. And we are going to set telephone type equal to, and then this is where you get to choose. Now you could just hand type it in there, but that's really no fun. So what we're going to do is we're going to say select um, common lookup ID from common lookup where common lookup table equal to telephone. You know, let's make this pretty. There we go. So if we were going to do the home phone number, we would do something like this. And 
And we actually already have this here. So we're going to take this, copy it. So we're going to use the same one twice. But the only thing is, is right now the broken ones, right? Because we actually already have this here. The broken ones are tied to address. So we want it where it's equal to address and equal to address type. In fact, we could actually, uh, so like if we did this, we can actually run, run this and see what we'd get. So it's equal to 1008, which is what we wanted. So this would update all of our uh, telephone types so that they match the right one after you've added the rows. And I'm going to show you everything, but that's it. And so you'd have to actually run this twice, once for home and once for telephone, or once for home and once for work. And I don't believe there's actually any work ones, but it's good practice anyways. Um, but anyways, that's pretty much the lab for the most part. Um, in this step, you're going to do a couple of things. Uh, you're going to uh, just alter the table. You're going to remove a column. You're going to add a not null constraint, which I think we did one of those last lab. You're actually going to add two not null constraints. And then we're going to use the create statement to add a unique index. Um, and since we've actually never seen one of those before, let's, let's look at how to add a unique index. And basically, the column you're going to remove is you're going to remove the common lookup context column because that's what the common lookup table is going to replace. All right, and so to create our index, and that should be right up here. Um, it's just like creating a table almost or a sequence. We're just gonna say create and then the name of what we wanna create. And in this case, a unique index. And we give it a name. And in this case, we're gonna call it common lookup U2. And we're going to say on common lookup. And then we say what we want it to be on. And in this case, we want a unique combination of common lookup table and common lookup type. And so basically what we're saying is there can't be address home or address address type and address address type. You know, basically we're just making sure our database stays clean. We don't want any duplicates unnecessarily. So that's how we create an index. All right, um, does anyone have any questions about the lab instructions? Like I said, I wanna spend some time uh, going over some of the new stuff. So an index, an index is, is a way um, that the computer um, can find things much more quickly. Um, and I always, and I know that, cause like I'm too young to like really remember this. And so not everyone might remember this, but in the old days in a library, um, you know, if you were looking for a book, we didn't have computers back then. And they had this big filing cabinet and it was the index of the library. And so if you were looking for something and, and people got really serious about how do you index your library? Um, for example, um, if you had a library and remember we're kind of spoiled because we have computers and so we can make choices on the fly. But if you're a library and you have one big shot at a filing cabinet that everyone's going to use to find your books, do you index alphabetically by the author? Do you index by the item title? Do you index by the reading level? Um, and so on and so forth, because that's how people are going to look, you know, and most of the time it was indexed um, by the author title, you know, Barnes and Noble, that's how they index their store. Um, and it's so, you know, when you're walking down the aisle, instead of having to go row by row, checking to say, see the, um, you know, check every title of the book till you find the one you're looking for, um, there's a method to the madness and that's what an index is. So imagine you're the computer and someone says, Hey, find this. 
um, you know, the, if you're in Barnes and Noble, you're going to walk and let's say we're looking for Brandon Sanderson, who is my favorite author, by the way. Um, you know, you're going to go and actually they don't index by, they, they do a mixture. So they index by book type. So fantasy and then by author. So, you know, if I'm looking for Brandon Sanderson, I look in the, um, in the fantasy sci-fi fantasy section. Um, so let's say, let's, let's just do this in a quick example. So we're going to create a unique index and we are going to call it Barnes Noble one. We'll just call it Barnes Noble. On Barnes Noble. Um, so, you know, we're going to do it on the category. So I go to, uh, um, you know, my uh, sci-fi fantasy, because I'm looking for the latest, uh, looking for the new Star Stormlight Archive book, right? So I go, I go in there and I find the, the science fiction. So that's one step one to narrow it down, right? And so then instead of going from millions of books, I'm now looking at 600, right? Because I narrowed it down. Um, and then furthermore, within each little section, they have it alphabetized by the author's last name. Right? So then we, then we look at the author last name and, and then we can, uh, you know, then, then we went from 600 books down to, if, if you're Brandon Sanderson, it's still quite a number, but you know, we went from 600 books down to 20. Um, and then furthermore, we can uh, sort it by the item title. Now, this is a this is a little bit deeper scenario um, because, you know, then you can sort by the item title. But anyways, an index is a way for the computer to more quickly find results. And so when you talk about, and you'll hear this often, um, in fact, a big part of what I used to do at Oracle was uh, query optimization or database performance um, analysis. Um, and I'm having a major brain freeze on the actual term. Um, anyways, um, basically, I, you know, working on performance because because when you're someone like Facebook, you can imagine how important it is to be able to find a needle in a haystack. Right. And so essentially what we're doing here is we are creating a way for the computer to more quickly identify rows in a table. Um, yes, there is a way to query uh, what the different indexes are. Um, and you can check the easiest way is actually to use SQL developer, which we're not quite there yet. Um, or um, Oracle Apex, something along those lines. Um, you can query the the information out of the data dictionary, um, but it's a little bit above um, the scope for right now. And in fact, indexes are a, a tuning. Sorry, I just came to me. SQL tuning, um, database tuning is all about creating indexes and optimizing. You're optimizing your database. Sorry, just came to me. Um, but you can query it out of the data dictionary. Most of the time, like I use... Uh, an IDE called dbeaver um, and it lists all the different things for me so I can look them up very quickly. Um, but Oracle Apex is there, that sort of thing. The nice thing is, is in our case and hopefully in yours, if you ever start developing databases, um, you know, write these scripts because if you ever need to spin up a fresh one um, for a development server or a sandbox, or if you delete something by accident, you actually have access to all this. So if you want to see what indexes there are, you can actually go through these scripts um, and they are in the create Oracle store dot SQL scripts. There may be a couple in the pre-seed just because after they put some data in and they put some more. But good questions. Um, great questions. Um, but yeah, so indexes are just a way for the computer to find things quicker. So for example, once we create the index on, on common lookup, um, it can filter down the results. So for example, if we say select common lookup table from common lookup, 
you know, if we were looking for uh, a certain something, you know, basically it can already know, let's say that it's, it has system user in it, like our query here. So let's say we're looking for um, the common lookup ID from common lookup where common lookup table is equal to address, right? Instead of having to read 20 rows and load 20 records into to memory, it will just load two. So basically it's just, it, it helps a lot because computers are just recorded human thoughts, right? It's not like they're supernatural and magic, right? Someone has designed them to do this and odds are that same person used to get books out of a library. And so, yeah, it, it, and you know, common sense applies back then as it does now. We just recorded that common sense the best we could into a computer. And that's what an index is. So great question. That is a very, very great question. I'm glad you guys explained that. Does, does that make sense to everybody? An index? And in this case, yes. we create a unique index, which means that there can be only one combination of table and type in, in the database. And, um, and so basically what we're saying is, hey, look, this is a unique combination and the computer, since it knows that they're unique, once it finds that unique combination, it knows that that's the only one that can exist and it can stop looking. All right, um, okay, let's, let's move on here. So there, there's lab six. Um, like I said, we covered a lot of that, so it shouldn't be too, too terrible. And as always, if you have questions, feel free to reach out. Um, but what I kind of want to do now, um, because what I've been doing in recent terms that uh, students have loved is not only go over the lab, but also um, do a little bit more. And we only have about a half hour to stay on my schedule. So we're going to dive right in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a new folder here a new file and I'm going to just build it under lab six. Um, we're going to create, and I'm actually going to delete all these, all these log files here. So it's just clean because we're kind of done with it. So let's move to trash. Nope. Move to trash. I don't like how a single click opens these. I don't know how to make that stop that move to trash. Okay, so I'm going to create a new text file. We're going to call it um, We're going to call it recipe db.sql. So on the way home, I'll think, man, you know, because we've been uh, for Mother's Day, my wife got this cutting board made that has my grandma who passed away uh, probably like five, no, it was probably 10 years ago. Wow, I'm getting old. Um, has her mom's uh, a recipe that she hand wrote engraved into this cutting board. That's what we got her from Mother's Day. Um, and I'm like, wow, that's such a good idea. Because, you know, thinking back, my, my grandma made the best meatloaf and she made amazing homemade brownies. Um, and I thought, wow, you know, how cool would it be if you could upload recipes into uh, family search. Um, you know, there should be almost its own little place. I mean, we're going to start putting them into the memories, you know, where you put the pictures, but you know, cause it's cool to see pictures, but think how cool it would be to go back to your great, great grandma and make the same cookies the way she did. So, you know, so, stuff like that. And so then, you know, I've been thinking about recipes a lot. I love food. I can't eat food, but I love food. And, um, so I thought, man, you know, we should do a recipe database. Um, as a demo for the class, because it's nice and easy, um, not too much. We can make it more complicated, but we're going to start pretty easy. Um, and, and then then we can kind of kind of build on it. So we're going to start building our recipe database. And we're going to kind of, I'm going to kind of flesh this out as we go, because I kind of have like just like a real basic idea of the tables we're going to have and maybe some of the data. But um, we're going to flesh it as we go, and we're going to talk about it. So if you guys have any questions um, or thoughts, ideas, um, feel free to share them um, because it's not like I have this file already somewhere else. It's the first time I've ever done this. Um, 
And then if you guys wanted, you could actually take this because later on in the class, we're actually going to build a, um, the last two labs of the course. Um, I, I kind of, I guess, per se, built my own version. Um, and we build Flask apps, which is a web application. And so you could actually build a little online repository of recipes. You know, it's kind of like those recipe websites where anyone can submit a recipe and that sort of stuff. We can, we're going to start out simple and then, and then go from there. So anyways, if we're going to build a recipe database. And along the way, we're going to talk a lot about uh, design and that sort of stuff. So you can kind of see one built from scratch. So let's start out with our create table. Um, and the one that I always like to start with is our, our user table. Because if we were going to make this online ready, um, you know, with users and stuff, we would obviously need a, a user table. Um, and I am going to follow in the footsteps of McLaughlin and call this a system user. So we're going to create a system user table and we are going to do things just a tad bit different. So we're going to have our system user ID and it is a number, obviously. Um, but this is where we're going to differ just a little bit. I'm going to have an email field. going to be a var chart too and we're going to let people have 60 character long emails um, and we also don't want this to be nullable so we're going to say constraint and we're going to say nn su1 not null and then we're going to have a password field now normally this would be encrypted but for the sake of simplicity we are going to leave this plain text but we'll prepare it we're going to make it 250 length so that if we ever need to, we can encrypt it. So constraint and then SU2 not null because we don't want a user without a password and vice versa. So we have email, password, and this is also where we're going to store their name. Um, so we're going to say first name. We'll let them have 60 characters for their name and we want that also to be not null. Now let's say we kind of want this so they could remain anonymous if they wanted to. So we're going to make a last name column, but we're going to, we're not going to make it so they have to put a last name because we want people to be able to have their privacy, right? So we're going to leave that one plain. Now, um, I can't think of anything else. You know, normally in a system, we might ask for a birth date, stuff like that, but we are not going to data mine off people because that's unethical, I guess, unless you get proper permission, but we don't want to worry about all that kind of stuff. So we're going to leave it pretty, pretty plain Jane. So let's actually just, uh, just do this. We're just going to make it that simple, right? And there's our table. Um, and let's actually, I'm going to take and run this, make sure it works. Oh, and of course it's already used by one. So let's call this something else. So let's, uh, let's just call it user for now. Normally I would, user in a lot of databases is a reserved keyword. So I try not to, and in fact it may, may be here. Yeah, see, that's why we usually don't use that. So we're gonna call it, uh, hmm, we'll call it app user. A system user. There we go. Now it can be different. Create the table app user. And there we go. And now we can describe our new app user table. Nice and simple. Now, to make our script rerunnable, I'm actually going to drop the table app user. We could use that fancy script, but like I said, it doesn't really matter too much. So we're gonna just drop it. And then we're going to create our sequence. So we're gonna say create sequence app user. And then that will be the sequence we use. Oh, and I guess I gotta give this, there we go. And now we have our sequence so we can do some inserts. Um, 
And what I like to do is I kind of like to just build one that has it all set up and ready to go. So I'm actually going to insert into app user and I'm going to insert um, the app user ID, email, password, first name, and we are going to leave last name null. So we're gonna just not put that there. And we're for our values, we're going to use the sequence. We pull the next val, and then our email, we're going to say um, admin at demo.fake, <laughs> right? Something like that. Um, and our password, cuddly puppies. Um, and our first name is we're going to call this admin. We're just gonna kind of create this admin user, right? So let's go ahead and do that insert. And then we can select everything from app user. And there's our stuff. Okay, so there's kind of like our, uh, our user foundation, right? We can store users now, pretty easy. Um, and so now we're gonna start getting into the meat of it. And so the meat of our um, stuff here is um, the recipes itself. Um, so we're going to insert, in, or not insert, we are going to create our recipe table. So we're gonna create table, recipe. We're gonna have a recipe ID. That's a number data type. Um, we're gonna give it a name, right? Um, and how long do we want to let people's names be? And this is, this is when you gotta start kind of thinking about, okay, user interface. Um, you know, what's this gonna look like when we actually try to display a name on a website? And how, how long do we wanna care, how, how, how much do we want to force people to bend to our will? Oh, and I forgot something really, really important on this one. Um, we forgot to make our primary key. So we're gonna say constraint uh, app user PK and it is a primary key on app user ID. That would have been bad. We would have, we would have had a table without a primary key. And what's cool is so because we have that drop, we can just go like this. And now our table's recreated. And then we can insert into app user. Now you'll notice that normally our app user would have been one, but since we're using the same sequence, since we didn't delete the sequence, um, we are now app user two, which doesn't matter too much. We're just gonna leave it there. All right, so then we uh, create our table our recipe table. And so, like I said, we got to start thinking about UI. So we're actually going to limit people's titles to 30 characters. You know, this is a title, not a paragraph, right? I mean, you're dealing with those uh, people that like to, you know, put the subject, the whole email in the subject line, right? This is what we're trying to avoid. Um, and so we limit the, the title of our recipe or the name of our recipe. Um, and a recipe has to have a name. So we're going to, um, we're gonna give it a not null constraint. There we go. Um, now, we also want to know who this recipe belongs to. And I like to put the foreign keys up at the top and then kind of put like the meat of the table down at the bottom. So we, we want to tie this to who, to a person. So we're gonna say app user ID, and that's a number. And obviously you can't have a recipe that's not owned by anyone. So we are gonna put a constraint there as well and then we'll renumber this other one. And so now if we wanted to, before we forget like last time, let's really, really fast build our, uh, our, our uh, primary key here. Recipe primary key and it's a primary key and it is on recipe ID. And then we also, since we have our foreign key to the app user, we're going to build a foreign key. So we're gonna call this F key 
one is a foreign key on app user ID and it references app user app user ID. And so here in our recipe, we could, uh, we could add a few different things if we wanted to, like uh, a good one might be a date. Date posted. And that is a date. And you know what, let's make that not null. You know, something like that. And like I said, I wanna kinda keep this simple so we're not gonna get too crazy. You can think of other things that you might want in there. Um, such as like maybe a category, you know, is this a bread or is it jams and jellies? Is it meat? Is it, you know, is it breakfast? Is it lunch? Is it dinner? You know, you could put all that kind of stuff in there. Um, you could have time to cook. Well, that's a good one. I, that's, that's one of my favorite ones. So we have date posted. Um, let's do time to prepare. And that's going to be a number. Uh, but they can leave that null because maybe they, they don't know. Right, or maybe it varies and, and stuff like that. So we're gonna we're gonna leave that null. So let's let's see how good we did here. Table created, we're we're good. So once it's created, I add my drop table recipe. So if we ever want to rerun, we could. And actually, what's kind of funny is now that we because recipe depends on app user. If we try to drop app user. Um, it won't work. So we actually have to drop these in order. So reverse order. So we're gonna say clean up. All right. Create our sequence. There we go. And let's say, you know, because we don't want anyone to be like, oh, I'm the first one on my recipes number one. Well, let's say start with a thousand one. All right, so there's our sequence and let's just run this, create it. And there we go. Now we're not gonna put a recipe in yet because there's another vital important part of a recipe. And, and that is our ingredients. And actually, I forgot one other thing. Um, what's a recipe without instructions, right? Um, so let's let's save this. And I'm actually going to, let's make our change. We have time to prepare. And we want to say instructions. And for our instructions, we want this to be a big one, right? And we actually have a good example of this if we describe item. Uh, oh, they don't have it in there yet. Um, we want to do um, a large text. Um, and so we're going to use a blob or a clob, sorry. Character large object. Um, and a clob will let us uh, basically store a large amount of characters. And in fact, we're going to pull it up here. So a clob character large object can be up to a lot of characters long. Um, so such as large documents and there any character set. Basically, we're gonna store a lot of data, a lot of text. So that's what we're gonna use. We're gonna use a clob. And uh, for the sake of right now, we're gonna leave that a not null constraint, all right? Because maybe you don't wanna provide instructions, maybe it's a family secret, who knows. Um, but that's where, you know, you have to understand what the consequences are in your business logic. Um, you know, maybe you'd want to have instructions uh, not in a little column. So anyways, let's save that and let's actually just run this whole script. Oh, and we uh, aren't dropping our sequences. So let's make sure we drop our sequences too. So drop sequence recipe. Drop sequence app user S1. There we go. We want to drop those and now everything gets created fine. 
And now just like our labs, every time we run this, it's gonna, gonna clean everything up and recreate it, which we only wanna do when we're in this development stage. And we're almost out of time, so I gotta hurry. So anyways, now we want to create a table ingredients. Um, and in this table, we're going to have an ingredient ID, which is a number. And we're actually going to tie this into a recipe. And, and, and this is, again, where you could have different. Let's say you wanted the user to choose, like, you know, rather than type it all in, let's say you could go in and search for an ingredient, such as brown sugar or whatever. We're going to let people actually just type in theirs because we don't, maybe we don't have access to a database of all the ingredients in the world, right? So we're going to let people just type it in manually. So uh, we have our, our ingredient ID, which is a number. We have our recipe ID, which is the foreign key. So that's how we're going to tie this to a, um, uh, a recipe. And for the sake of time, I'm going to shorten that up. Um, so we have our ingredients. Uh, we're going to give it a name. Chart two, and we're going to let this one be 60. And the constraint, we want to make it, because, you know, there's no reason to have an ingredient if you're not going to actually type what it is. And then, obviously, we want an amount. How much of it is there? And because in amounts can be liters or whatever, now normally you would probably put a drop down for that, right? Um, and that's actually a really good idea, but we're out of time. So normally what I would do is this would be a great place to have like a table called create table measurement type. And actually we're just, we're just gonna do it real fast. Measurement type and name is a varchar to, and this one's not gonna be very long, but we're gonna be gracious, give it 30, and we're also gonna give it a code. And the code has to be 10. And then we need to make our primary key. And like I said, I'm gonna shorten some of this up for the sake of time. Primary key, uh, me type ID. All right, there's our measurement type ID, and we create a sequence called MT underscore S1. You might want to change your char char to Varkar. Ah, uh, yes, very, very true. Like I said, we're we're going to go uh, a little quick here. So we have our recipe ID, which tells us what the recipe is. And then we want to have our measurement type ID. It will be a number. All right. And our measurement, uh, we're gonna let this one be uh, 20 characters long per se. There we go, okay, let's hurry and build our constraints. So we're gonna have ing, ing primary key, primary key, gradient ID. We're gonna build a foreign key on our recipe ID. It's going to reference our recipe. Recipe ID. And then our last constraint is going to be our, another foreign key, but it's going to be on our measurement type ID. And it is going to reference measurement type, 
measurement type ID. Whew. Let's see how we did. So let's uh, drop table measurement type, drop sequence, empty S1. We're gonna drop table ingredients, drop sequence range. I don't think I made the sequence yet. Let's already make our sequence. Create sequence. Okay. Make sure everything worked. Okay, we're golden. Everything's working. Okay, so now that we have that all created, let's uh, do some inserts, right? So let's uh, start with a user. So we're gonna say insert into app user. And let's actually take and copy our original one. Cause this is actually where you'd start letting people, I guess you could say use it. Um, but since we don't have time to build the AI or the UI, sorry, the user interface or like all the backend, we're gonna kind of just go with this. So I'm actually gonna say, let's, uh, let's email tannerfake.com. We're gonna have that be cuddly puppies. And my name is Tanner. And I'm gonna leave my last name blank because you know, I don't want to give out my whole identity to someone. Um, and then, so I'm going to create a new recipe. So we're going to say recipe um, and if we come up here and we look at recipe, actually, let's just do it here. Describe recipe. We have our recipe ID. Um, the app user ID. the name, date posted, time to prepare, and instructions. So for our recipe ID, we're going to use recipe underscore s1 dot next val because we want to just use that sequence. And then for our app user, right, because we're inserting it right here, I'm going to use app user <coughs> s1 dot curval because that's going to link them up and then the name what are we going to make uh we are going to make uh homemade vanilla pudding oh that sounds good doesn't it um and the post date is today right now so we're going to say sys date um the time to prepare uh let's say uh 30 minutes and that's a var var chart right time to prepare oh what is that oh i made that a number so we're going to say in minutes you know in the instructions we're going to just assume that that's minutes so we're going to just take this and make it a 30. that's so people can't type weird things all right and then the instructions and this is where we could say I don't have the instructions handy and we're running out of time or else I would type something really funny about how you can actually make homemade pudding. Cause I make really good homemade, homemade vanilla pudding. All right, so uh, there's our recipe. I'm actually gonna take and run these two things here real quick. Actually, you know, let's just take and rerun the whole thing. At recipe db.sql. And there we go, we get our one row created. And in fact, we can select everything from recipe. And there's our, our vanilla pudding. Anyway, so now we want to add, um, there's a couple things we need to add is, and one is our measurement type. So I'm gonna say insert into measurement type. And the nice thing is, is because here, um, measurement types are not gonna be something we let users add. So we're gonna real quick add this up here. Um, and it's nice and easy actually, because there's only three columns. So we're gonna say measurement type ID is mts1.nextval. Um, the name is we are going to say a tisp. Um, actually, we're gonna say teaspoon. 
for the name, all fancy. And then the code is gonna be the teaspoon. And we're actually going to take, and we're going to do this a couple of times. Looks like this one's going to be a cup. And then let's add another one for um, I, don't, I don't know what a tablespoon is. So we're gonna just say TBL. Okay, so let's save, let's rerun because we built everything so it's rerunnable. So now we have our measurement type. So now let's real quick, we're gonna add an ingredient and then we'll, call, we'll add a couple ingredients. Uh, instruction, whoops. Insert into ingredients. Let's take a look at our table here. And actually this would probably just be ingredient, not ingredients, but whatever, we'll, uh, we'll roll with it because we're almost out of time. Um, and we have ingredient ID. And actually, you know what, let's fix it while we're here. There we go. Problem solved. Our ingredient ID, recipe ID, measurement type ID, the name and the amount. All right. And so now for our values, we are going to use our sequence for the value of our primary key. And then we're gonna use recipe underscore S1 dot curval, because we are going to connect these. And then we are going to use our, we're gonna use a subquery, select um, measurement type ID, I would definitely shorten down that table because there's nothing worse than having to type so many characters. All right, and the name is we are gonna say milk. And the meow is going to be one. And the amount, is that a number? Nope, that's a var char. Um, we could make that a number if we wanted to, but we're gonna we're gonna do that, and then we're actually going to do another one. Um, you know, what, let's do two cups of milk. I actually can't remember. Um, and then we are going to do one tablespoon of vanilla extract. You know, and I like mine extra vanilla, -y, so we're gonna use two spoons. All right, so let's save that. Let's rerun our script here, make sure everything works up oh, and we have an issue. Oh, we have an issue here because we violated a constraint here. So ingredient. Oh, because we, uh, let's do this. Drop table ingredients because we changed it before we dropped it. There we go. There we go. All right, so single row subquery returns more than one row. So let's say, select everything from, oh, and that's because we're duplicating because we forgot to add, um, or I probably typoed something and I did, I'm pretty sure. measurement type. Oh, and that's because we actually need to drop. This is where order when you're dropping is important because we couldn't drop measurement type because ingredient was dependent upon it. So we have to drop ingredient then member measurement type. So let's run this again. And let's see, well, there's still something going wrong. So let's take a look here. Um, it's already been used. 
Oh, drop sequence. There we go. We would have had an issue there anyway, so that works out just fine. There we go. So now we got everything being created. So now if we wanted to, you know, pull a list of all the ingredients we needed, we would say select a uh, name or, you know, we could uh, select everything from recipe you know, and there's our homemade pudding and we'd have our instructions. And then if we wanted to see what um, ingredients we needed, we would say select um, I dot name, I dot amount and uh, MT dot name from ingredients, ingredient I, enter join measurement type MT on I dot MT, I dot measurement type is equal to MT dot measurement type ID. And I actually like to put ID on all of them so that way it's pretty clear that it's an ID value. And since this is the only one, I'm only gonna pull the one. Normally we would say where, actually let's just do it, where I dot recipe ID is equal to 1001. And then we get our ingredients. So if you were building your web application at this point, you would pull the recipe name and the instructions, the time to prepare, all that kind of fun stuff, make it look all cool. And then, you know, if you wanted to build a table with the list of your ingredients and how much um, you need of it, you would have this. So we just uh, started building a recipe database. Um, and that's all the time we have for now right now because we, we're about 12 minutes over already. Um, but did you guys enjoy this? Was this helpful in any way? Um, very cool. Okay, good to know. Um, and hopefully that kind of lets you see the process because sometimes it's nice to just see it from scratch, you know, um, and things you can think of. Um, and who knows, maybe later on we'll, we'll keep working on this. Um, but, you know, hopefully it helps you kind of see the whole picture because instead of, you know, working with something that kind of already half exists, you just saw it being built because our database was kind of built the same way. Um, they probably just thought about a little bit more so they weren't jumping around as much. But, you know, that's part of the, the same thing. And so I guess my challenge is, uh, you know, because we're at week six now, because basically the labs from here on out, we're, we're going to be started to more focus on um, objectives um, rather than kind of just like, oh, here's a concept, learn it. Because surprisingly, here, here's, a, here's a big uh, fun tip is, we've actually, for the most part, learned all of the topics that we're going to learn in the course. So for you, those of you who are like, holy cow, like, how do you keep track of all this? The good news is, is that uh, we're really not going to learn that many new uh, statements. You, you've, pro you've about got them all. Um, we're going to be iterating upon them. We're going to be using them a lot more. Um, there's going to be a little less hand-holding as far as the instructions go. Um, but the nice thing is, is that you're going to become more comfortable. The, for basically, from here on out, we're going to get a little clever with the way we use some. We're going to use some intermixed, like, you know, subqueries and stuff like that. We're going to use those in different places. Um, but the rate of new material is really going to slow down, and instead you're going to be practicing just like this. I mean, you're not going to be building one from scratch, but basically we're going to put you in a scenario and say, here, look, clean up this, and here's kind of an idea idea how to do it and some steps. Um, so I hope that this kind of helps you see the big picture and maybe um, get your mind rolling. And so I guess my big uh, challenge is that if you do have free time, I mean, obviously finish your lab first, but I cannot stress enough how if you really want to master this material, um, the labs are great practice, but if you really want to master it to the point to where you could teach someone else, you know, try building a database from scratch. Um, you know, my favorite thing um, is um, I, I grew up on a dairy farm. So when I first started learning how to program, my first thing was like, oh, I'm going to, you know, build this thing so my dad can uh, track his cows. You know, this is right when I'm 
straight out of high school and I was in a C++ class, didn't even know what a database was. And so I built this uh, command line based application that would keep track of cows, but it was not persistent, meaning that, you know, it never actually stored the data, but it was a cool proof of concept. And anyways, um, you know, so there's, there's probably something in your life that, you know, maybe is your problem to solve or, or maybe there's just something um, you're interested in. Um, and so what I would uh, challenge you to do is, is not only do the lab if you have time, I mean, don't take away from your family or anything, but if you have time, there is no uh, replacement for just practicing. Um, and I guess just to show you where my desire has gone is I have actually built this, which is running on a database that I built. It's using Flask as the main driver for the web framework. But we can actually, uh, you know, my dad, these are my dad's cows that he uh, runs on his, his farm. And we can actually uh, come in here and see uh, all their various information, their vaccinations, uh, what pen they're in, um, and their demographics, when they were born. Um, this is one of the older cows that they have. And so, you know, the mother and father link right there. So, you know, if, if you have something you're curious about, try it, you know, start building your own databases um, and, and, and you'll learn lots and they don't have to be anything complex. You know, this is a one, two, three, four table deal and we could have just done it in three tables. So if you have an idea, give it a shot. It's a great way to learn. But anyways, we are out of time. Um, so I'm going to let you guys go. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask me on Teams or other various methods of communication and great luck this week.